We're down to a fairly small crowd, which is a pity, because Rich Robinson is always an entertaining speaker. He's uh, one of, uh, Fritz mentioned earlier in his talk about how Rich has been one of the mainstays of the uh, tax scene in China right from the very beginning, uh, experience dating way back to the original RenRen.com. Uh, right, which was uh, back in the uh, back back boom in the days. first dot com boom. Uh, but Rich is on a, a new project uh, now. Uh, why don't you tell us uh, what you're doing, Rich? First of all, I think it's awesome that Fritz uh, mentioned me because I'm I really regard Fritz as a as a terrific uh, you know really the leading foreign entrepreneur here. And I got a really uh, another really nice compliment this morning. Somebody told me that I wasn't uh, as stupid as I looked. Uh, then they actually said that it wasn't possible. Which, that's, that's good, right? Isn't that good? I don't know. Well, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so right now, I am, uh, it, it's funny you mentioned RenRen. So I was part of RenRen back in the 90s, sort of RenRen 1.0, uh, that also went public, um, and then we sold the company. The CTO of RenRen, uh, he left and uh, started another company called Oak Pacific, which then rebought the RenRen domain and listed it a couple of weeks ago. Um, and... Uh, he was the co-founder and CTO there, and he's my co-founder, my new venture now. Um, and my new venture is called Yolu, like, uh, uh, like friend list, I guess you would uh, uh, literally translate it. And the sort of thesis of the company um, is that the biggest uh, social network in the world um, is not really QQ, nor Facebook, nor, uh, nor Renren. It's really uh, already in your, your pocket. Uh, everybody has their really um, tight select buddy list, and it's in their mobile phone. So the mobile phone address book, uh, we feel uh, is something that holds uh, a lot of promise. Um, and we also feel that it's something that's really not uh, been done you know, extremely well uh, across multiple platforms uh, in, the, in the mobile phone. There's a lot of room for, for improvement. So w what exactly will the product do? So we've, uh, we're actually already live. We're about uh, 18 months old now. We have had uh, millions and uh, millions of downloads already, uh, mostly in China, but uh, I'm, I'm heading up uh, international. And what the, what the product uh, is doing right now, um, the first wave of the product uh, made uh, kind of a better mousetrap, put the uh, mobile phone address book on steroids, so better user interface, better experience, better search, uh, automatic backup in the cloud. Uh, ability to better customize uh, the address book for a lot of the new uh, sort of web 2.0 features to be able to put in, you know, Twitter addresses or Skype or, you know, other IM, et cetera. Uh, the next wave was we started to take sort of the tendrils of the mobile phone address book and uh, uh, dig them deeper into the phone. So we took over SMS. Uh, so now the SMS client is integrated right into that uh, um, address book. Because when you're really messaging uh, somebody, you're not really thinking about messaging, so to speak, you know, necessarily you're really thinking about, I want to connect with that person. And just a couple of weeks ago, we launched a, an instant messaging uh, product uh, as well, too, sort of um, along the same uh, vein as uh, WhatsApp or Kik. Um, and uh, we're uh, constantly uh, you know, innovating and adding uh, new features around that sort of core address book feature. And in the, in the future, um, we have in the pipeline to be able to also integrate these other uh, social networking sort of dynamic features uh, into the phone. So can you take me through the user experience? I have a Nokia phone. I've got a bunch of phone numbers and contacts on it. I'm going to use your service, and then in six months' time, I'm going to switch to an iPhone or an Android phone. What, what will I do? What will I do download? And yeah, that's upload? a perfect example. So if you really look at it right now, everybody has, you know, in, in some ways kind of... Um, written off Nokia, um, uh, at, least, at least the Symbian handsets. But you know, this year, I believe, you know, it's going to ship 125 million Symbian handsets. And there's already more Symbian handsets uh, out there now than all the other mobile operating systems combined. So uh, Symbian is really something that's uh, uh, still quite interesting. But the problem is that the Symbian OS is kind of like a 1990s sort of style uh, OS that really hasn't been heavily innovated since then. So we take over that address book. It becomes a default address book. It's more than an app. It kind of becomes part of the default operating system. And where do I get the... the Download it over from? the air. So in the future, we hope to do more preloads and other partnerships, but it's all OTA downloads or o o o OTA um, over, over the air downloads. Um, and then it becomes your, your default uh, address book. And it's just a much smoother uh, experience. And we have, you know... Um, I basically do a lot of the uh, international customer service because I want to be there kind of flipping burgers, so to speak, getting my 
my hands into the loom and really seeing what's going on with the product and with the, with the customer. So I, I respond to a lot of the customer service stuff and I see that people are very thankful because the operating system for Symbian, the, the, the address book, it's really like a you know, 300% uh, in improvement. Um, everything's backed up on the cloud and I, I believe we have one of the best, if, if not the best sort of solution if you are uh, on Nokia and you want to switch to Android like, like I, I just recently did um, to be able to easily uh, port your contacts into Android or into iPhone and in the future we're also doing Winmo and uh, some stuff with Blackberry and uh, also uh, MDK and uh, you know we have a, a decent amount of users now that have multiple handsets and it actually syncs their address book across uh, multiple handsets uh, as well too so you could have you know a personal say uh, um, lower end Nokia and maybe a, a business uh, um, you know uh, Android phone and it's all synced up. And where is your focus geographically? Right now the vast majority of our users are in China. Uh, we haven't done our really big push um, globally but we've had over uh, 170 different uh, countries around the world uh, users from those countries download our product. Uh, Eighty percent of our users are still in China um, and you know I'm one of the three co-founders and I'm the uh, president of International as I mentioned so what you know, I, I remember somebody telling a story about these guys out walking and uh, there's, uh, there's a bear and the guy, uh, one of the guys sits down and starts tying his shoelaces tighter. And the other guy says, hey, what are you doing? You can't outrun a bear. And the guy says, yeah, but I can outrun you. <laughs> See you later. And, and runs away. And I think uh, uh, the sort of, um, maybe it's not a very tight uh, analogy to what, what we're doing here, but I think you know, here, here in China, it may be so wildly competitive and difficult to kind of really uh, compete with, within the China market, although, although we feel pretty confident about that. But I think you can take stuff that's made here in China and sort of forged by fire, so to speak. Then you can take that sort of a la like some kung fu movie with that ball of energy and just that and push it out to Indonesia or Europe or South America and you have such a, uh, a product that's been uh, scaled up and broken and fixed and broken and fixed and then it becomes a lot, uh, um, a lot more or, you know, uh, powerful when, when you're taking it to other markets. So maybe, maybe in China, China's, uh, you know, you can easily scale to tens of millions of users and perhaps the business model is not as smooth and perhaps the competitive landscape is a lot stronger but you can take things here and you know, really out, outrun everybody else in, in those markets, outrun the local competitors or other international competitors. And in, in fact, I think Chinese companies will be doing that a lot more now. In the last year or two, with the iPhone, with Facebook, with, you know, other platforms, Chinese companies are starting to look outside of China and just kicking other companies' asses up and down the road. And I think that's going to be a, a big theme in the next you know, three to five years as Chinese companies marching out internationally and just, uh, you know, dominating in markets. Let's switch to a different theme that we were chatting about just before uh, we got on stage. You're, you have some ideas about the, the app economy, app versus browser debate, and the current conventional wisdom, or at least uh, among certain quarters of the tech community, is that the app economy is on the rise, the web is dead, it's the famous Wired cover. Uh, you have a different take on it. I have a completely contrarian view. I believe that four years ago, apps didn't really matter that much and four years from now, three, four years from now, apps won't matter as much. You know, if you really look at like your PC, I mean the PC environment is very homogenous. It's very easy to create apps for that. Um, on the phone environment, it's actually quite difficult. It's becoming much more fractured now. Yet on the PC, I don't run that many apps. I have maybe my Windows suite, which I increasingly, which I, which I decreasingly uh, use now because I'm more focusing on, on, on Google. I might have Skype. I might have my antivirus, and I might launch a few apps now and then. But almost everything I do is in the browser. Uh, the you know it, it, because it just it just absolutely makes sense um, with uh, um, with the sort of powerful uh, tools you can you can use in the browser. And I think on mobile. Um, it's been a little bit limited now, but I think with the rise of HTML5, I think that you know in the next couple of uh, years, more than a billion new users will be on 3G. Um, so people will be sort of mostly always on. But uh, with HTML5, you can still do browser apps, mobile browser apps, or PC browser apps that are uh, that can run offline. So I think the mobile browser is going to be sort of like this white dwarf star with this this 
you know, um, unavoidable gravitational pull that's just going to suck all of these apps that people have into the browser. It just doesn't really make sense to launch. You know, I don't, you know, launch my weather app when I'm on my PC. You know, I just go, you know, Google some weather, right? I mean, perhaps some games will still be played because they need maybe that, uh, that native processing speed, but I think a lot of other functional and other, other apps, news apps, are all going to get pulled into the browser. And I think that the address book is one thing that's going to stay. It's going to re remain behind while everything else kind of, you know, crumbles down around it. That's going to be one one thing that's going to stay. And you're going to really think more about like, oh, I want to connect. I want to contact this guy. I mean, oh, I got to launch my Facebook app. I got to launch my Twitter app. I got to launch my Skype app. I got to launch this other IM app. You know, why don't I just do it all from the address book? And that's sort of our our thesis that people will. So the app economy will decline, but your product won't. Uh, I, uh, th that's, that's the prediction. We'll see. Yeah, I guess you got to put all your chips on something in any startup, right? So that's my, that's my reality distortion field you okay. know, right now. Well, speaking of reality distortion fields, I'd just like to end our talk off with some uh, of your thoughts on <clears throat> being a foreign entrepreneur in China. It's, uh, it's very rare to find successful foreign entrepreneurs in, in the tech space in China. There are successful investors. There are quite a lot of examples. Uh, but people who've managed to build, sell, and profit from companies uh, who are not Chinese but have done it in China, it's very, just a handful of people, and you know them all. Um, why is it so difficult? What's your advice for other foreign entrepreneurs looking to start up in China? Yeah, I, I think entrepreneurship just in general is, is very sexy, but it, the, the reality of it is just it's extremely difficult. You know, it's just really not, you know, it's hard. And uh, I think that um, the vast majority of, of, of companies really just end up failing. And, you know, here in China, I've kind of taken a while to kind of find my legs in a way. Uh, you know, China doesn't really need me, right? They, you know, they do it very, very fine uh, without me. Um, and that's why in this, in this new company, I'm really uh, doing this sort of, you know, la wai guanxi thing, right? That's like, that's really, that's something that I can bring to the table. And I can perhaps have a, a, competitive, a competitive advantage. I think in the tech space, or especially in the internet or mobile space, if you're doing something that's facing into China, then man, there's just this absolute just wave of entrepreneurs, tens of thousands of people who are just willing to work a lot harder and they just have more, more, more guanxi or they're just able to do it uh, on, a, on a lower budget. So I think we're going to see a lot more amazing companies you know, being created here in China by Chinese entrepreneurs. I know a lot of other foreign entrepreneurs that are very successful here in China, maybe leveraging stuff that's made in China and kind of pushed out to the rest of the world or perhaps selling stuff into China outside, outside the tech space. But I think, it's, I think the window is really closing. It's going to be really difficult to be able to create something that's very appealing to the, uh, you know, to the, to the very demanding uh, you know, local, local internet users. I mean, you know, and, and if you look at uh, you know, one, of the, one of the secret sauces of, of Fritz is that Fritz you know, very wisely chose an area that was not necessarily entertainment focused, right? He's doing something that's really, you know, is based on really doing something very efficient and you know uh, with uh, with businesses and he's really creating you know what, whatever the, the cheapest price is out there he can he can do that and he does it better than anybody and he's been you know very successful he had another uh, internet uh, company that was more consumer facing before you know Xiaowei and I think he you know he saw that that's uh, a little bit more more difficult to uh, um, to actually be competitive in the space. But I think, I still think China is one of the best places in the world to start a company and then create something here. And maybe you have just a lot of learnings in China, high skill, low cost, lots of users. And then you can also, I mean, one thing that I love about doing stuff in China is that you can launch stuff in China and, you know, Chinese uh, companies kind of work well together. Like, you know, there's certainly there's conflict, but you can like, you can quickly scale up to a lot of users. You can do deals here, and you can make things work if if there if there really is a fit, and you can get um, you can get things you can, you can make things happen. You can really make things happen here, and then you can sort of take all of those learnings because I love this definition of um, 
a startup by Steve Blank, who's the professor of entrepreneurship at Stanford. And he said, a startup is a vehicle <clears throat> to test assumptions until you can find a viable, repeatable, scalable business model. So basically, you're like, oh, nope, that's wrong. Okay, let's go, oh, nope, that's wrong. Oh, nope, and then you, you can actually just do as many cycles as you can to actually make the thing work. And I think China is actually quite a good testing ground for that. And if you can make something work here, even if it's not working really well, then I think you can take that and push it out uh, to the rest of the world in a really uh, effective way. Okay. Rich, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Oh, Jeremy Goldcorn of Downway, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> thank you, Rich. Awesome. English and Chinese. Thank and Afrikaans. <laughs>